I am a sinner. You are a sinner. I am blessed and you are blessed. May the God who promised to be with us this morning do so. Amen. My friend Jackie is a brilliant attorney. She breezed through law school. She got an important job at a white shoe law firm and immediately carved out a reputation as a dependable, intelligent, and hardworking lawyer. But after she got married and she settled down, for some reason, a deep, dark depression began to settle in. She went to her doctor, gave some medication, and began seeing a psychologist. Initially, the tide was stemmed, but not completely, and her descent into the dark, dark abyss continued. Jackie had to leave her job. More than once, she checked herself into a psychiatric hospital, but she continued to read up on her condition, making suggestions to her doctors about new treatments, about new courses of actions, new medications, and doing all she could to get better. But of course, she kept suffering. And at one point in the throes of her despondency, she became suicidal and utterly convinced that everything was lost and that her life was no longer worth living. But she fought off those voices and she kept up her regimen of doctor visits and of medication changes. And somehow, some way, by the grace of God, Jackie, who's a woman of deep faith, she did not give up. And then all of a sudden, one day, well, the fog just started to lift. I'm not completely sure what happened, she told me, but one good day turned into another. The bad days were getting better and so were the good ones. Now today, if you met Jackie, you would have no inkling that she'd gone through all this. But if you press her, she would very soon be inspired by the depth of her faith and her resolve to tell you what happened and to tell you that it was through the depth of her faith and with her resolve to never ever give up. This is like what we see in today's gospel with the woman with the issue of blood and with Jay Iris, the father of that little dead girl. These are people whose story of resolve is meant to speak to you and to me this morning. If Jesus shows you and me anything through these two stories, it's that even someone who's been painfully sick for 12 years, even somebody who's died, has not gone past the pale of possibility when God is involved. They have not exhausted the power of God to turn absolutely hopeless situations around and to save the day for you and for me. It makes me wonder about the hopeless situations that you and I are facing this morning. What is it for you? Will our jobs improve? Will our marriages improve? Will our schools improve? Will our health improve? Will our nation survive? Will we ever be truly happy? <coughs> the God we read about this morning has a particular slant, have you noticed? And suggests possibility, not impossibility. Viability, not inviability. Feasibility, not infeasibility. We serve a God who is particularly bent on helping us. It's curious, and maybe you've noticed this too, that in the Gospels, they don't contain any stories that portray Jesus as lacking compassion, mercy, care, or deep love for us, and especially for the suffering, marginalized, and distressed. For example, you and I don't hear stories like this. One day Jesus came to a sick person and he said, I'm not healing you because you ate way too many desserts and that diabetes you have, man, that's all your fault. We don't hear Jesus say, I really would like to heal that broken arm, but that's what you get for being such a jerk to your wife. We don't hear Jesus say, I'm not gonna take away that arthritis until you learn to be nice to your kids. Can't you see I'm teaching you a lesson? No, we never hear Jesus talk to us the way we talk to ourselves. God is kind and thoughtful and caring and gentle, much more loving and understanding than we are to ourselves and that we can possibly imagine God being to us. God's not out to work against us, but with us and for us. Sometimes I wonder about the form of organization that's at work in the kingdom of God. I mean, what's the kingdom of God looks like? I mean, who's really in charge? How does it operate? Ever wonder that? We often get this sense that the kingdom of God is like this dictatorship. 
that God sets the agenda, God sets the course, the world's sitting up there in some throne, and then he rules with like this iron fist. Or we figure that God runs things like a free market capitalist, right? Letting the forces at play dictate the course of events while God stands on the sidelines watching and taking notes, but really not doing much of anything. Or we can figure that God has set up a partnership, that God is actively involved in the world, in your life and in my life. The scriptures suggest that God has exalted us, promoted us, and allowed us to work with the Holy Spirit who was sent on our behalf to act as partners, right? So a third idea would be God works with us as a partnership. The kingdom of God is a partnership. Remember, brothers and sisters, Jesus called us in John to be friends. Jesus anointed disciples to go do his work in his name with him alongside in the form of the Holy Spirit. And with the same anointing we received at our baptisms, which allows us to make certain decisions. It allows us to determine certain courses and actually have a say into how world affairs are conducted. In this last scenario, this partnership with God that I think is at play here, as you and I see the active role that Jairus and the woman with the issue of blood take to arrive at their respective results. Now take the woman with the issue of blood. She's suffering, what, for 12 years? Having spent all of her money on doctors, nothing to show for it. And she's not at home complaining about her condition. Did you notice that? She's not at home complaining. She's not cursing God for making her sick, right? She's not resigned to the fact that, oh, things will just never get better. No, what is this woman doing? She is out and about actively looking for God. Not for one week, not for one month, not for one year, but for 12 years. So what is this woman like? Well, she's hopeful, she's faithful, and at the end of the day, she's healed. What does that say to you and me about what you and I are going through? How are we behaving with the bad hand we've been dealt with? Because you know, nobody, nobody's got a perfect hand. I don't know if you've noticed that. I was talking to a rich man the other day, a really wealthy guy, and he was complaining about his yacht. Yeah, he was talking about his yacht. He says, it seems that he was late in contacting the marina in St. Bart's. You know where St. Bart's is? A really nice island down the, down the uh, Caribbean. And because he was late in contacting the marina in St. Bart's, he had no place to store his yacht for the winter. Boy, was he mad. Boy, was he disappointed. He was in a bad mood. Now, not finding a place to park your yacht for the winter may not be your specific dilemma this morning, but it goes to remind us that we always have something to complain about. We always have something to get angry about. We always have a reason to give up. But what we see in the witness of this suffering yet faithful woman with the issue of blood for 12 years is that she never, never gave up. Or take Jay Iris. He was suffering more than his daughter. Remember, he's, he's the father of this daughter who, who was sick and then died. Well, of course, he was suffering more as his daughter. Any parent out there knows that quite intimately, as everybody who's been a parent would take a bullet for their child, and we don't see him resigned to a doctor's opinion that there's no hope. We don't hear him consulting the funeral director or ordering the headstone. What we see is that Jairus, remember, it says he's a leader of the temple whose leadership was full of suspicion and derogatory opinions about Jesus, is willing to go against the tide and reach out to Jesus. Sure, he was desperate, but he was also determined, and he was hopeful, and he was unwilling to ever, ever give up. I have a friend who gained a lot of weight after college. Combination of bad eating, no exercises, a lot of partying. He didn't do anything about it for years until one day he decided he would. He talks about the first time then that he strapped on his running shoes, right? He's going to go out for a run. And, and he goes out for a run. And actually, it was, he describes it as more of like a walking shuffle. And he talks about how young kids on a playground that he passed would, would stop and point at him. And, and he knew what they were laughing at. And then four months later, he talks about how proud he was to be able to actually kind of pick up the pace and, and kind of begin to jog. And when a group of junior high girls kept lapping him at the, the park and they were giggling under their breath and he knew what they were laughing at. And then four months later, when he was able to actually run, 
he talks about getting lapped at the senior center. Well, I heard him tell all these stories a couple years ago from the winner's circle after the Los Angeles Marathon, where he took first place in his age group. His message runs parallel to what we've been hearing this morning, and that is no matter what challenge, what difficulty, what heartache that you and I are facing this morning, let's not give up. Like the woman with the issue of blood and that devoted parent, Jay Iris, let's not throw in the towel, give up hope, or entertain the possibility of failure. It's so easy to do. How is God asking us to be a people of hope as God, as a God of hope? You and I, friends, are in partnership with God. We know our Lord walks beside us, encouraging us with words of healing and hope as we leave our place of worship, our time of worship this morning. How can we listen more deeply to those words of encouragement from God? And how can we echo those words to a hurting world around us? Remember, we are to be the voices of hope, the channels of hope, of God's hope for the world and for those around us. Let us go forth, my friends, serving a God who never, ever gives up. Amen.